The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The appearance of our visitor was a surprise to me, since I'd expected a typical country practitioner. He was a very tall, thin man with a long nose like a beak, which jutted out between two keen grey eyes, set closely together and sparkling brightly from behind a pair of gold-rimmed glasses. I came to see you, Mr. Holmes, because I am suddenly confronted with a most serious and extraordinary problem. I have in my pocket a manuscript, said Dr. James Mortimer. I observed it as you entered the room, said Holmes. It is an old manuscript. The exact date is 1742. Dr. Mortimer drew it from his breast pocket. This family paper was committed to my care by Sir Charles Baskerville, whose sudden and tragic death some three months ago created so much excitement in Devonshire. I may say that I was his personal friend as well as his medical attendant. He was a strong-minded man, sir, shrewd, practical, and as unimaginative as myself. Yet he took this document very seriously, and his mind was prepared for just such an end as did eventually overtake him. Holmes leaned back in his chair, placed his fingertips together, and closed his eyes with an air of resignation. Dr. Mortimer turned the manuscript to the light and began to read it. Of the origin of the Hound of the Baskervilles, there have been many statements. Yet as I come in direct line from Hugo Baskerville, and as I had the story from my father, who also had it from his, I have set it down with all belief that it occurred even as is here set forth. Know then that in the time of the Great Rebellion, this manor of Baskerville was held by Hugo of that name, nor can it be gainsaid that he was a most wild, profane, and godless man. It chanced that this Hugo came to love the daughter of a yeoman who held lands near the Baskerville estate. But the young maiden would ever avoid him, for she feared his evil name. So it came to pass that one Michaelmas, this Hugo, with five or six of his idle and wicked companions, stole down upon the farm and carried off the maiden. When they had brought her to the hall, the maiden was placed in an upper chamber, while Hugo and his friends sat down to a long carouse. Now the poor lass did that which might have daunted the bravest or most active man, for by the aid of the growth of ivy which covered and still covers the south wall, she came down from under the eaves and so homeward across the moor, there being three leagues betwixt the hall and her father's farm. It chanced that some little time later Hugo found the cage empty and the bird escaped. Then he became as one that hath a devil, for rushing down the stairs he ran from the house, crying to his grooms that they should saddle his black mare and unkennel the pack, and giving the hounds a kerchief of the maids, he swung them to the line, and so off full cry in the moonlight over the moor. Now for some space his guests were unable to understand all that had been done in such haste, but at length they took horse and started in pursuit. They had gone a mile or two when they passed one of the night shepherds upon the moorlands, and they cried to him to know if he'd seen the hunt. And the man said that he had indeed seen the unhappy maiden with hounds upon her track. But I have seen more than that, said he, for Hugo Baskerville passed me upon his black mare, and there ran mute behind him such a hound of hell as God forbid should ever be at my heels. So the drunken squires rode onwards, but soon there came a sound of galloping across the moor, and the black mare dabbled with white froth when passed with trailing bridle and empty saddle. Then the revellers rode close together, for a great fear was on them. They came at last upon the hounds. These, though known for their valour, were whimpering in a cluster at the head of a deep dip or goyle, as we call it upon the moor, some slinking away and some with starting hackles and staring eyes gazing down the narrow valley before them. The company had come to a halt. Three of them rode forward down the goyle. Now it opened into a broad space. The moon was shining bright, and there in the center lay the unhappy maid where she had fallen, dead. 
but it was not the sight of her body. Nor yet was it the body of Hugo Baskerville lying near her, which raised the hair upon the heads of these three roisterers. But it was that standing over Hugo and plucking at his throat. There stood a foul thing, a great black beast, shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye has ever rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore the throat out of Hugo Baskerville, on which, as it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life. Such is the tale, my sons, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued the family so sorely ever since. Nor can it be denied that many of the family have been unhappy in their deaths, which have been sudden, bloody, and mysterious. Yet may we shelter ourselves in the infinite goodness of providence, which would not for ever punish the innocent beyond the third or fourth generation which is threatened in holy writ. To that providence, my sons, I hereby commend you, and I counsel you by way of caution to forbear from crossing the moor in those dark hours when the powers of evil are exalted. This from Hugo Baskerville to his sons Roger and John, Baskerville Hall, 1742. When Dr. Mortimer had finished reading this singular narrative, he pushed his spectacles up on his forehead and stared across at Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Do you find it interesting? To a collector of fairy tales, replied Holmes. Dr. Mortimer drew a folded newspaper out of his pocket. Now, Mr. Holmes, we will give you something a little more recent. This is the Devon County Chronicle of June the 14th of this year. It is a short account of the facts concerning the death of Sir Charles Baskerville, which occurred a few days before that date. The recent sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville has cast a gloom over the county. Though Sir Charles had resided at Baskerville Hall for a comparatively short period, his amiability of character and extreme generosity has won the affection and respect of all who have been brought into contact with him. In these days of nouveau riche, it is refreshing to find a case where the scion of an old county family, which has fallen upon evil days, is able to make his own fortune and to bring it back with him to restore the fallen grandeur of his line. Sir Charles, as is well known, made large sums of money in South African speculation. It is only two years since he took up his residence at Baskerville Hall, and it is common talk how large were those schemes of reconstruction and improvement which have been interrupted by his death. The circumstances connected with the death of Sir Charles cannot be said to have been entirely cleared up by the inquest, but at least enough has been done to dispose of those rumours to which local superstition has given rise. There is no reason whatever to suspect foul play or to imagine that death could have been from anything but natural causes. Sir Charles was a widower and childless. In spite of his considerable wealth, he was simple in his personal tastes and his indoor servants at Baskerville Hall consisted of a married couple named Barrymore. Their evidence, corroborated by that of several friends, tends to show that Sir Charles's health had for some time been impaired and points especially to some affection of the heart. Dr. James Mortimer, the friend and medical attendant of the deceased, has given evidence to the same effect. The facts of the case are simple. Sir Charles Baskerville was in the habit every night, before going to bed, of walking down the famous yew alley of Baskerville Hall. On the 4th of June, Sir Charles had declared his intention of starting next day for London, and had ordered Barrymore to prepare his luggage. That night, he went out as usual for his nocturnal walk in the course of which he was in the habit of smoking a cigar. He never returned. At twelve o'clock, Barrymore, finding the hall door still open, went in search of his master. The day had been wet, and Sir Charles's footmarks were easily traced down the alley. Halfway down this walk, there is a gate which leads out to the moor. There were indications that Sir Charles had stood for some little time here. He then proceeded down the alley, and it was at the far end of it that his body was discovered. One fact which has not been explained is the statement of Barrymore that his master's footprints altered their character from the time he passed the Moorgate, and that he appeared from thence onwards to have been walking upon his toes. No signs of violence were to be discovered upon Sir Charles's person, 
and though the doctor's evidence pointed to an almost incredible facial distortion, it was explained that this is a symptom which is not unusual in cases of death from cardiac exhaustion. This explanation was borne out by the post-mortem examination, which showed long-standing organic disease, and the coroner's jury returned a verdict in accordance with the medical evidence. It is understood that the next of kin is Mr. Henry Baskerville, if he be still alive, the son of Sir Charles Baskerville's younger brother. The young man, when last heard of, was in America, and inquiries are being instituted with a view to informing him of his good fortune. Dr. Mortimer refolded his paper and replaced it in his pocket. Those are the public facts, Mr. Holmes, in connection with the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. I must thank you, said Sherlock Holmes, for calling my attention and that of my colleague, Dr. Watson, this with a gracious wave of his hand in my direction, to a case which certainly presents some features of interest. This article, you say, contains all the public facts. It does. Then let me have the private ones. He leaned back, put his fingertips together, and assumed his most impassive and judicial expression. In doing so, said Dr. Mortimer, I'm telling that which I have not confided to anyone. My motive for withholding it from the coroner's inquiry is that a man of science shrinks from placing himself in the public position of seeming to endorse a popular superstition. The moor is very sparsely inhabited, and those who live near each other are thrown very much together. For this reason I saw a good deal of Sir Charles Baskerville, with the exception of Mr. Franklin of Laughter Hall and Mr. Stapleton, the naturalist. There are no other men of education within many miles. Within the last few months it became increasingly plain to me that Sir Charles' nervous system was strained to breaking point. He had taken this legend which I have read to you exceedingly to heart, so much so that, although he would walk in his own grounds, nothing would induce him to go out upon the moor at night. I can well remember driving up to his house in the evening some three weeks before the fatal event. He chanced to be at his hall door. I had descended from my gig and was standing in front of him, when I saw his eyes fix themselves over my shoulder and stare past me with an expression of the most dreadful horror. I whisked round and just had time to catch a glimpse of something which I took to be a large black calf passing at the head of the drive. So excited and alarmed was he that I was compelled to go down to the spot where the animal had been and look around for it. It was gone, however, and the incident appeared to make the worst impression upon his mind. I stayed with him all the evening and it was on that occasion, to explain the emotion which he had shown, that he confided to my keeping that narrative which I read to you when first I came. It was at my advice that Sir Charles was about to go to London. His heart was, I knew, affected, and the constant anxiety in which he lived, however chimerical the cause of it might be, was evidently having a serious effect upon his health. I thought that a few months among the distractions of town would send him back a new man. Mr. Stapleton, a mutual friend, was of the same opinion. Then, at the last instant, came this terrible catastrophe. On the night of Sir Charles's death, Barrymore the butler, who made the discovery, sent Perkins the groom on horseback to me, and I was able to reach Basketball Hall within an hour of the event. I checked and corroborated all the facts that were mentioned at the inquest. I followed the footsteps down the yew alley. I saw the spot at the moor gate, where he seemed to have waited. I remarked the change in the shape of the prince after that point. I noted that there were no other footsteps save those of Barrymore on the soft gravel. And finally, I carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until my arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with some strong emotion to such an extent that I could hardly have sworn to his identity. There was certainly no physical injury of any kind, but one false statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there were no traces upon the ground round the body. He did not observe any, but I did.